So good afternoon, everybody. I'm assuming it's afternoon or evening, wherever you're at. And uh, we're going to do Isaiah um, 14 today. Thank you for coming and, and listening. And I'm just going to say hello to everybody because I know I'm going to forget people on DLive and, and Clout Hub and miss a name. and uh, even have some uh, people over there on Twitch and Facebook. So uh, that's pretty cool. But uh you know, I'm I'm happy that enough people are interested in in diving a little deeper into Isaiah to hang out with me a little bit than uh, uh, some of the other um, shows that I don't I, I don't know anybody else going this deep into any book on the in, on the internet on any of their streams. I'm breaking my habit of calling it a podcast because I learned yesterday they're not interchangeable words. So. Uh, that's my technical uh, uh, limitations here. <laughs> I had no idea I was using the word wrong forever. But uh, with that, uh, thank you for coming. You know, hope you're enjoying this. And I and I have received a uh, book in the mail and, and, and I, some donations. And I really appreciate that, you know, funding my addiction and book buying. So uh, either with... Uh, the donations are actually sending books. That's just uh, very helpful and and very supportive. So, with that, I'm ready to start. If you are, let's, let's take a look at Isaiah um, chapter 14, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Right. So, oh, and I forgot to do this. I'm always good. So I always you can email me at bill at discerningtruths.com. Uh, you know, I've received some cards and letters that the uh, um, we keep a mailbox in Temecula, but uh, three one eight zero five Temecula Parkway, number two one eight, and uh, in Temecula, California. I've got some cards and letters that was wonderful to come there. Uh, Michael and I are uh, are looking at another Prophet Club um, episode, maybe multiple. We have so much to cover; it we're probably looking at multiple more profit clubs and then as always the slides i use today will be up in uh, um, discerning truth groups on telegram so that you can uh, use them to look up any of the notes i did scripture references and check me out and i absolutely suggest you do to whoever you listen to is uh, listen with an open mind and then search the scripture to see if what they said is true so um, Monday and Wednesday, I do uh, uh, Isaiah study until we finish Isaiah. On Tuesday, I'm normally on with Neo. She's taking a couple of days off or a couple of weeks here, uh, two Tuesdays in a row. My understanding is we'll be back and doing Tuesdays next week. And if you're not already listening to uh, Michael Beatty, a.k.a. AKA Miguelifornia on uh, DLive, on his uh, morning uh, devotional, worship music. He does uh, uh, Proverbs and then picks a book in the Bible. Right now he's in First Peter. Just started that. That's a uh, um, up there. In, in I, it's 5.30 my time, and what a way to start my day. And yes, Papa Don, I have uh, the book wish list that's on Telegram is currently current. It's still there. So um, that's it. But yeah, just uh, I totally uh, hope that you will get that kind of enjoyment. I do listening to Michael in the morning. His music blesses me. And then his he is really turning into a uh, pretty spectacular teacher as well. So uh, that's a good way to start your day and to get your morning going. If you're on the East Coast, you're well into your morning by the time he's on at 830. But, uh, you know, I, I just... Uh, I want to share that blessing with you because uh, what a what a talented and uh, just wonderful person Michael is. And and Linda, uh, his wife Linda is there with him on Sunday morning and they do a great job on that. So with that, we're going to start Isaiah now. And Isaiah uh, 14 in the first four verses, and I've shifted to the English Standard Version um, most of my quotes that I'm doing on the slides are going to come out of the English Standard Version. That's going to be my default version right now. 
if it's old material, I may still have the King James or New King James up there, but most of this is, uh, Isaiah is completely new for me. I've never done this kind of deep dive. So that's the version that's going to be on our screen, but you can always check it in other versions as well. And it says, For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land and sojourners will join them and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob and the peoples will take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel will possess them in the Lord's land male and, as male and female slaves and they will take captive those who were captors and rule over those who oppressed them when the Lord has given you rest from the pain and turmoil and hard service with which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. So, this chapter and verse breaks in this Bible were added centuries after the Bible was written um, and way after this text was written. This chapter is a continuation of the prophecy from the last chapter. So, why there's a break here is hard to believe. And then in previous chapter, Isaiah now pronounced judgment on Babylon. Both the historic Babylon that is going to fall to the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And a future Babylon. Now, the future Babylon may be in the literal location of Babylon, or it could be a metaphor for a future kingdom. Uh, but the, the pronouncements are against the, the past and future. A prophecy continues here with the explanation that the judgments are against Babylon are in part because of God's compassion on Jacob. So it's basically, uh, I will bless those that bless you, I will curse those that curse you. The fact that they conquered Judah and took them into captivity and held them in, in uh, bondage which was a judgment caused by God. God pronounced it, that it was going to happen. He used Babylon to punish Judah. But you still are responsible for your own choices. We are all. And the Babylonian kings were responsible in, in their choice to go ahead and, and do that. So it, it's th this prophecy against the king of Babylon in a, uh, it is partial in the sense that the... Uh, in the mouth of the returning exiles when, uh, when Babylon was finally conquered and the people of Judah could return to the promised land. But in an ultimate sense, this prophecy is against the spiritual king of Babylon. The principality and power behind that kingdom. Okay, you remember Ephesians 6? We, we fight not against, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Those are spiritual entities. They are, they are the the powers behind human government and human organizations and they're um, sometimes called the gods of this world. I, I just heard somebody this morning refer to them as mosquitoes or gnats. Uh, no, they are principalities and powers. They are seriously powerful entities from the spiritual realm. And that one entity that empowered the uh, Babylonian kingdom is no slouch. When Daniel is praying and looking for an answer and uh, the angel comes from God to visit him and says, I left heaven to come to you as soon as you started praying three weeks ago. But the prince of Persia withstood me. Well, it's not some human prince that withstood an angel, I guarantee you. He's talking about a principality and power behind these that withstood that that angel. And then the uh, archangel Michael had to come help him to free up his, his hand so that he could come deliver Daniel that message. So this idea of these powers behind these empires and governments are um, is all through scripture. And a lot of times what they're doing is... Um, talking to those entities rather than the human government or sometimes it's both like uh, we saw with the king of Tyre in, in the prophecies in Ezekiel he starts talking about the king of Tyre and then pretty soon he says you were in the garden of Eden well that king in Tyre was not in the garden of Eden he's talking to a spiritual entity behind that that spiritual entity empowered empires 
It's not some gnat you can swat away. It's not something you can cough out in a napkin or any of the other nonsense we see going on in the world where people think they can just uh, swat demons like they're, they're nothing. These are serious spiritual entities with significant power, and our battle against them is fought in spiritual warfare. And uh, I may... I mean, it, it's becoming clear that I'm going to have to do a uh, stream on spiritual warfare because uh, that seems to be misunderstood uh, today, but uh, not today. I'm not going to interrupt Isaiah to do it, but uh, one of these days I will I will get it out there probably on a Friday. Not this Friday. I need some time to prepare, but I will deal with that. Thank you. So in verses 5 to 8, it says, The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, that struck the peoples in the wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting, unrelenting persecution. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you. The cedars of Lebanon saying, uh, since you were laid low, no woodcomer cutter comes against you, against us. Okay, trees in Lebanon, right? Are not rejoicing, and the um, you you the cedars of Lebanon or the cypresses and and those those aren't. This is clearly metaphor. Now, is it metaphor for the people in Lebanon? Is it metaphor for spiritual entities? What are we talking about here? And we've already seen Isaiah using trees as a metaphor for people in this uh, earlier in this book and even for the spiritual powers behind nations. So that should again be clear here when Isaiah speaks of the cypresses rejoicing in the cedars taunting Babylon, he is not talking about trees, right? And nobody would suggest you interpret it that way. So when we get the revelation and they talk in this same kind of language, you want to have that same interpretive view that I'm not going to take it literally, right? It, it's, a, it's a metaphor Speaking of something that's literally true, but it's using metaphoric language, and it still uh, it still makes it true, but it's that's the way you would understand this. So you have a historic application of this prophecy, and it's easy to understand. Whenever a world power has dominated other nations and it falls, the people who were conquered rejoice. The Babylonian rule here is pictured as especially brutal and tyrannical, right? So the people that were underneath that tyrannical rule are, of course, going to be rejoicing. So you have that that temporal, that within time and space in history, that fulfillment, right? But to understand the spiritual application, we need to understand that nations are empowered by those celestial beings, those principality and powers that Paul talks about in Ephesians, right? And the final kingdom will be empowered by one of those principalities as well. And the remnant of Israel, including us Gentiles who were grafted in. Remember, we're the wild olive branch that gets grafted in uh, to the natural olive tree. And Jesus is the olive tree. And the natural olive branches where the promises went to Israel first. And we're grafted in to become part of spiritual Israel um, as, the, as the Christians. But um, he tells us in that, um, story about the olive branches being grafted in, not to get too haughty in ourselves, that it's just as easy for God, if he can graft in a wild olive branch, can he graft back in the natural olive branches? And he said, so don't get all up in your own uh, pride over this stuff. And um, so we're going to re we're going to rejoice when those evil forces finally fall, right? And um, that happens in the day of the Lord at the end of this age. And God is going to, once and for all, wind up and, and destroy evil. And evil is, is spoken about in Scripture, personified at, in the Leviathan, that dragon, that beast. The Leviathan is a seven-headed dragon, uh, serpent creature that lives in the, in the, is seen as pictured as living in the sea. Okay. And the sea is metaphor for the Gentile nations, the nations. Uh, the land is Eret Israel. It's the, it's the land of Israel. 
So you have a land beast that deals with uh, Israel. You have a sea beast that is the Gentile nations, but it's evil is being pictured there. Not some dinosaur living in the ocean. Okay, that's not what it's talking about. It's a, it's a metaphor and you can see it. Uh, the Leviathan's best explained in the book of Job, but he will pop up over and over again. In fact, in the book of Jonah, as I explained, it's not a whale that is pictured as swallowing Jonah. Although the word can be translated whale, what he's talking about is Leviathan. And you can see that, that Jonah, Jonah is dead. He goes to Sheol, Sheol, to hell, Hades. He's dead in the belly. Evil has swallowed him and God causes him to come back up. And so basically it's a model of the resurrection of Jesus. And that's why Jesus says the only sign you're going to be given is the sign of Jonah, right? In, in the resurrection. All this Old Testament stuff, these stories, meld together in a, in a meta-narrative of God versus these evil, um, disobedient entities, right? He put them in power over, over um, the nations. They disobeyed. He's going to judge them. And ultimately, um, that's what uh, hell was created for, was for them. Um, but some humans have decided they would like to go there as well, and they don't want to be with God. So they may end up with them in the, in the final ending. But it was really to punish those beings, those celestial beings who disobeyed with God, right? And then in Isaiah 14, 9 to 11, it says, Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you. And all who were leaders on the earth that raises their thrones, all who were kings of the nations and of them will answer you and say, you too have become as weak as we, you have become like us. Your pomp has brought you down to Sheol. The sound of your harps, maggots are laid on the, on the bed beneath you and the worms are your covers. So in one way, this is talking about the death of the uh, king of Babylon but just as uh, Jonah going into Sheol, it, it's it's talking about that entity that he has um, lost his power. He's become weak. And you're going to see the Babylon, the, the prophecy here for Babylon is that as powerful as it was, as much of a, a world dominating power as it was, it's going to fall and it gets replaced by the uh, Medo-Persian Empire. Right? And then... Um, so hell is excited to meet the king of Babylon because it can't wait to be the place where one who tortured so many is also tortured himself. This is true for the king of ancient Babylon and the king of spiritual Babylon. Satan is a loser, and he certainly isn't the boss or lord of hell. That's a Dante's Inferno uh, idea. Satan's going to be persecuted in hell. He is not the, the lord of hell, right? Satan's going to go to hell as a victim, as the, the ultimate prisoner in the dungeon of darkness. And hell will be happy to receive him. And now hell, that's a personification of hell that, you know, a place can't be happy, but that's what it's describing him is that the hell would be happy to have him. And the, the king of ancient Babylon, who saw himself as above everyone, was supposed to exposed as a mere man. Likewise, the spiritual king of Babylon goes to hell. All will be amazed to see that it was he was made like us. And you see the judgment against the Elohim, these other gods in the Old Testament. And you can start in, in Psalm 82, verses 6 and 7. I said, ye are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men you shall die, and you shall fall like any uh, prince. And this is in a, in a courtroom, in, in God's being pictured as uh, judging the Elohim, these rulers that were set over the nations to rule them. And that continues. It's in Psalm 89. You, you'll see it in Deuteronomy 32. There's, there's a number of other Psalms where that uh, is pictured. And I'm just trying to uh, lay some groundwork here that, that's what's going on. That's the background narrative here in Isaiah. 
is he's promising them, yeah, the the Babylon will be judged and a future kingdom that may be literally Babylon or, or just metaphorically Babylon is going to be judged. But it's the power behind those that's really going to be judged. And I think from Ezekiel, you're going to find out that that um, spiritual entity um, that's going to lead that final um, empire is not even the entity that lead was behind Babylon. It, it, he is called the Assyrian in Scripture. And um, it would be another study, but I believe it's the Assyrian who was in the garden and not Satan. But um, that's a rabbit trail for another day, you know. So Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, the far reaches of the pit. Okay, so if you have any doubt up to this point, that he's talking to a spiritual entity and not the human king of Babylon. The human king of Babylon could not even dream of making himself equal with the Most High God. But this is a uh, an celestial being who thought himself worthy to be equal with God. Right? And he falls. And it says he, he will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. And stars are used as a metaphor of angels or other celestial beings, often in scripture. So he saw himself as being above the other angels, higher than the other angels, right? And this is this, this uh, power in the Babylonian Empire, right? And so it's Lucifer who is called the bright and morning star. It's Lucifer um, who is uh, sought to be equality with God. And um, so you can see that it, either he directly or indirectly through an intermediary controlled the empire of Babylon, right? And he's probably controlled Egypt and Assyria and, and other kingdoms along the way. And because through his little army of uh, other Elohim, right? And the king of ancient Babylon also is also being pictured here as seeing himself like a god, right? His arrogance let him think that he could come against the God of uh, Israel. And both are brought down to the pit. So this says dual meaning again, right? And in Luke 10, 18, it says, And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. Okay? And you're going to see this as the passage we just read is talking about um, the fall from heaven. And Revelation 12, 9 says, and the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So both Luke and Revelation are taking Isaiah's words and alluding to them in the, in repurposing those words in their in their passage. Oh, I never changed the screen. Sorry. I'm on another slide. You're not on. <laughs> Let me put it over there for a minute. Sorry, a little, uh, little failure on my part to get you there. But uh, I just read you the slide. I just put it up for a minute for you to see it. And uh, this time I'll try to transition with you. It was a uh, failure on Bill's part here. So in Isaiah, um, we just read uh, 12 to 15, but in 13 it says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. Now look what, what Matthew does with this. And you, Capernaum, you will be exalted to heaven. You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty work is done, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And then Luke says, and you, Capernaum, you will be exalted to heaven. You should be brought down to Hades. So they're basically talking about they're they're alluding back to Isaiah with this idea of us uh, ascending to heaven and being brought down, and uh, in Matthew in Isaiah fourteen fifteen it says 
but you are brought down to Sheol in the far reaches of the pit. And Matthew continues, and you know, in, in 11.23, I cited it here above and below because he, he also picks a piece of that verse out for this. And Luke 10, 15, and um, he is bringing that out. So he, they're basically taking verses 13 and 15 out of Isaiah, taking a piece of each verse and putting them together in one thought. And that's common in the New Testament and extraordinarily common when we get to the book of Revelation, where they will take uh, a piece of one passage and a piece of another passage and sew them together in a new way, sometimes not in a way that even uh, resembles how they were originally used. And it's kind of like repurposing the verse. It's exactly opposite about how most of us are taught to interpret Scripture. What the New Testament writers did doesn't um, follow those hermeneutical, hermeneutical rules that we learned about how to interpret scripture and how to uh, take everything. And even the ones I pushed on you about context, 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 and let scripture interpret scripture, they really pull it apart. And that's why the Holy Spirit had to have his hand in there to guiding them into what they were doing, because otherwise we would say they were just uh, proof texting and, and pulling scriptures out of context, right? So in verses 16 to 23, it says, those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch, right? Clothed with the, and slain, those pierced by the sword who would go down to the uh, stones of the pit and, uh, and like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have been destroyed in your land and you have slain your own people. May the offering of evil doers never more be named. Prepare uh, slaughter for your sons because of the guilt of their fathers, lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. I will rise up against them declares the Lord of hosts, and I will cut off from Babylon name a remnant and remnant descendants and posterity, declares the war Lord, and I will make it a possession of a hedgehog in the pools of water, and I will sweep it with a broom of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. So here again, you see all the metaphorical language, all the posturing, and what I didn't point out here, remember in Isaiah had called Jesus the branch, Right. Look at how the this is like a juxtaposition. He, he is Jesus is the holy branch, the offshoot and the, and the remnant. Right, you know, produces the remnant, and then he's looking at this evil side and says, you know, you're the branch, right? You're a loathed branch, right? You're clothed and stained. Jesus is pierced. Those pierced by the sword. He he's like uh, using these uh, same language he used to Jesus the coming Messiah, and using it in a negative sense against the king of Babylon. It's like uh, the tale of two cities, one of Jerusalem and one of Babylon, one of good, one of evil, one of the Messiah, one of the, uh, the evil leaders. And that's the way this is being presented. And it says, when the king of literal Babylon fell, his weakness was exposed, right? So you have this partial fulfillment. And others were amazed that one who had so much power could uh, fall so far. But the same will happen to the king of spiritual Babylon falls. This is a seriously powerful spiritual entity that's been there since the ancient days and creating problems. And when he falls, it says everybody's going to look at him and wonder, like, was this really who we were afraid of? Was this who shook kingdoms? Is this who uh, dominated the world? So you can see that dual meaning is all through Isaiah. And then this is another reason why I get frustrated with this. Now we're now we're going to Assyria. No chapter and verse break, no chapter break, but we shifted from Babylon to Assyria. The Lord of hosts has sworn 
As I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian. Okay, and pay attention to that name, because I'm telling you, the Assyrian is the spiritual entity behind Assyria. In my land and on my mountain, I will trample him underfoot, and his yoke shall depart from them, and his burden from their shoulders. This is the purpose that I purpose concerning the whole earth, and this is the hand in which is stretched out over the, all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, who will turn it back? Okay, so basically here Isaiah is a, um, affirming God's absolute sovereignty and authority and the ability to uh, make his will come to pass. So when the Assyrians invaded Judah in 2 Kings 1935, describes how God simply sent the angel of the Lord and he killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. And um, that would be a historic interpretation of this passage. But the title, The Assyrian, is used in scripture for a specific celestial being who empowers nat nations. And you can see that in Ezekiel, Hosea, Isaiah, and, uh, and chapters 10 and uh, uh, 14 and 19 and 30 and 31 and 52 and Micah 5. This is all going to come up again talking about this Assyrian character. And I'm telling you, when he comes up and he's identified that way as the Assyrian, we're talking about a celestial entity. And prior to about 150 AD, the Jewish people taught about two powers in heaven. They saw God, this spiritual unseen God, this creator, that nobody could ever see, you couldn't be around him. But they also had this character that was showing up in the Old Testament, sometimes in human form, sometimes in the angel of the Lord uh, presence, sometimes as a pillar of fire or, or smoke. He had a physical uh, representation in, in the Old Testament. And they saw that as a second power in heaven. And not that there's two gods, but when the, when the Christian church came around and said, yeah, you know that second power? That's Jesus before he's incarnate. That's who he is. It's a second person in Trinity then they made it illegal to teach that. But the angel of the Lord here, that is Jesus before his birth. That's the son of God. The second person of the Trinity shows up. He's not an angel as a class of being. Angel just means messenger. Of the, of, um, he's a messenger. He's the messenger of God. And he came down here and he sent a message to Assyria. And his message was, I'm going to kill you all. Right? And so they, they didn't even have to fight against the Assyrian Empire. The um, angel of the Lord did the fight for them. So some commentators believe the Assyrian will be a spiritual power who empowers Antichrist, based on Ezekiel 31, 3-9. The Assyrian is said to have been in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the word Satan simply means the accuser. It's not a proper name, but we use it as a proper name. And we use it so much as a proper name that when I tried to write Satan in, in uh, without capitalizing it, uh, Spellcheck told me I was wrong, right? So it forced me because it's seeing it as a proper name. If they had translated it to the accuser, then you would have understood that the accuser and the Assyrian and Satan, and they can all be titles for the same celestial being okay and uh now we're going to transition to uh philistia uh, where you get the name the philistines right and it says in the year that king ahaz died came this oracle rejoice not O philistia all of you that the rod hat that struck you is broken for from the serpent's root remember Root is descendant, right? From the serpent's root will come forth the adder, and its fruit will be a fire, flying fiery serpent. And the firstborn of the poor will graze, and uh, the needy lie down in safety. But I will kill your root with famine, and your remnant I will uh, slay. Wail, O gate, cry out, O city, melt in fear, O Philista. All of you, for smoke comes out of the north, and there is no stranger in its ranks. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion, and her 
um, the afflicted of the people will find ref refuge. Again, you can see this is all symbolic language. This is all metaphor because um, you know you know find these and the uh, this fiery serpent was a symbol for one of the gods that were worshipped and it, and it was first worshipped in Egypt and um, that may be why uh, they during the Exodus God used a bronze serpent as the uh, uh, symbol for them is that basically it's it's mocking that God from Egypt you know what's happening here and uh, so Isaiah again uses that he utilizes very symbolic language here. We've already seen the root means a descendant. The serpent is symbolic of evil celestial forces. The fiery serpent is the, is the uh, uh, god in Egypt, right? And uh, the main god of Philistia was Dagon, the father of Baal. And you're going to see that in Judges 16 and 1 Chronicles 10 and 1 Samuel, Samuel 5. And so Yahweh claims Zion for himself. There's not another Elohim, not another celestial being over that territory of Zion. That belongs to God. But the surrounding nations had other celestial beings over them, and some of those celestial beings sought worship for themselves, and they got in trouble. And that's why I kept putting you back to Psalm 82. But for more information on the other gods, the other Elohim in the Old Testament, I did... Um, I guess I'm using podcasts wrong. I, you, it, it's my stream, o, o 45, who, who are the other Elohim in the Old Testament. And um, I'll fix that right now while we're here. And I go into this in more detail about the other Elohim, but it is, um, it's definitely, it's part of a, a meta narrative going through scripture. And that's what I want everybody to understand. So, before I go to uh, the video and, and read the chat, I just going you know, to put up this, uh, what do you call it, last thing on, on my, uh, how to support what I'm doing. If you feel like uh, you want to support it, I absolutely appreciate it, right? And, uh, but if you, if you don't feel uh, the need to support, don't worry about it. There's no compulsion here, right? And uh, with that, I'm going to play a video, read the chat, and then I'll come back and see you in just a minute. Thank you. This bird. 
All right. So, yeah, I'll get back to some other questions. But, Debbie, that's a great question. Is blaming Satan for all your problems, money, health, extra biblical? He's not omnipotent. That's absolutely correct. That is not a biblical point of view. Um, Satan is um, doesn't have that ability. He, he's moving um, powers and, and in this world. But it's it's not, and if you sin, it's not the devil made me do it. Um, you know, idea. We we have choices, and we have to do that. And our God, the God we serve, uh, He that's in us is more powerful than than any other of those other beings. So you can't. That is not a biblical point of view. That it's Satan's point of view. You're right on there, right? And then I saw the uh, the question from Brain Troll about. Uh, could this be inbreaking of Islam? And I think Islam is empowered by one of these entities, these celestial entities. If you actually studied Islam, and if you see the evil of which it was started, and I I have relatives that are followers of Islam, and they basically follow a, a peaceful version of Islam, but the Islam that was taught by Muhammad is what I'm judging it on. And the Islam taught by Muhammad was very violent, very um, uh, disturbing the way um, he saw of himself. And he expected to be uh, accepted as a prophet by the Christians and Jews. And when he wasn't accepted as a prophet, that's when he turned on them. And uh, the God of Islam can change his mind at any moment. So... It's whatever the latest revelation is. That's your new word from God, your new marching orders. So there's passages in the Quran that teach uh, Muslims to live in peace. But the more recent passages that are there after Muhammad changed his mind it would tell you things like lay and wait and kill us, uh, not to be friends with any, to, to break them. They're, they're very hostile. And the difference is when they were given. And they're not putting it in the Quran in chronological order. So that takes a little bit more digging to figure out what's the latest marching orders from Allah. Since uh, he is uh, uh, able to just uh, be capricious and change his mind whenever he feels like it. Right? You know? And uh, praying to I like what you did with that loose... Lucifer, the way you respelled Lucifer's name to a Lucifer. That's kind of interesting in... Uh, then, uh, yeah, in the end, all those evil forces, everything that's been plaguing mankind all of these years are going to get dealt with, right? It it's all wraps up in the, in the book of Revelation, and they are destroyed. And then we have that eternity with God, a peaceful eternity with God, without these evil forces that have decided for themselves that they wanted to be worshipped. I don't know what prevents other ones from falling again in the future, how that's going to work, but uh, it seems to be that it's uh, 
not going to happen, that when we have the new heaven and new earth and things are putting back into the Edenic state, the state that Adam and Eve were meant to live in, when we go back to that state, that there won't be any fallen entities that need to be dealt with. They're all going to get dealt with once and for all at the end of uh, the book of Revelation. And it's, uh, like I said, this story is woven through the entire Old Testament. It's hinted at in, in a number of books in the New Testament. And uh, then it wraps up in, in Revelation. But it's one constant meta narrative. You have the big narrative of God's redemption of mankind. But he's not just redeeming men, right? And he's redeeming creation, right? It says all our creation groans under the weight of sin, right? And Samantha says, where in the Bible do Mormons give scripture for their beliefs that they were given a different word? Um, yeah, it's it's not that um, they provide a, a scripture that says that a another testament is coming, but because they don't accept the fact that um, the canon of scripture was closed, and so they're, they're free to get a new... Um, a new revelation from another angel and uh, that he provides it. So that's why they call it another testament of Jesus Christ, the Book of Mormon. It's, it's, they think they got new, better information and it's up to date information. And in their temple ceremonies for the Mormons, they actually ridicule Christian ministers for supposedly having uh, uh, corrupted the, uh, uh, the book. And then, uh, yeah, I'm seeing I'm getting topics for Friday, soul sleep, and then uh, learning more about the other names of God. Uh, the other names of God might be something I I might be ready to take on a little quicker than soul sleep, but uh, that that's an interesting study all in itself is what are the other names and what do they mean, the names and title of God that are used in in the Old Testament. Pretty, uh, pretty cool study, and that's something I could probably put together pretty quickly, so... I don't know. We'll see. Soul sleep take a little more work for me to get to Papa Don. So I don't, I don't know. And I just uh, seen today when we were looking at the Passion Translation in uh, the Prophet Club episode two B, uh, and we looked at the Passion Translation. I was dealing with it without going against the the guy, the uh, the translator of that Passion Translation, as much as just comparing what he wrote compared to what real translations of the Bible say. I seen a video this, this morning and I shared it where uh, he claims he got that information from an angel named Passion and that's why he calls it the Passion Translation. So just like the Book of Mormon came from the angel Moroni, supposedly, this guy claims that the angel Passion gave him the, the ability to translate words in languages he doesn't read or write. You know, so if you're not convinced yet, not to use the Passion Translation and not to follow people that are using it. Just understand, you're walking down the same road the Mormons did. You want to do that? Then start listening to people that use the Passion, passion Translation. You want to stay clean? Use a Bible that there's a lot of good translations out there, right? And uh, that you can you can come to and... Uh, there, I'm not sold on one translation. I use a number of them. You see me, I use the Masoretic text and I go look in the Septuagint and, and for the Old Testament passages. And I use a half dozen different translations for the New Testament. It's not that one is so much better than the other. I'm not the King James only person, right? But the Passion Translation is not a translation. Just get that clear. It's not. It's somebody that went to work trying to write their doctrine into word and claiming God did it, right? And uh, they are out there. And when I found out that he claimed he got it from an angel, I said, well, that explains a lot, right? And I still have friends posting stuff in uh, verses out of that Bible, and, and I can't stop them. All I can do is tell you the truth. And the truth is, it's a, it's a version of the Bible you need to stay clear of if you want the truth. It's not where you should be going. So with that, I uh, I plan to be back Friday. We'll be talking about something. <laughs> I don't know. It may be the names of God. I don't know where I'm going to go yet between now and then. 
but um yeah and and remfer you you could be correct that a lot of people using it are unaware that that's i always try to give people um the benefit of the doubt but um we have put it out there and the people that i know around me that are using it are aware because i exposed it and michael in the profit club we exposed it and for them still to be using it is an intentional disregard of the truth and that's problematic right and i and uh so it's there so with that i mean god bless you all and uh with any uh luck i will be back here friday you know and uh we'll see where we go god bless you Thank you.